Mm -hmm. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's so good to see so many beautiful faces here on this Zoom class. And this day workshop is called 2020 Insights, Seeing Clearly with the Heart, Mind, and Soul. So this event is hosted by the Anabuti Meditation and Retreat Center, which is administered by the Brahma Kumaris. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Padilla. I'm a resident uh, teacher here at the Retreat Center. Um, 2020 has proved to be a very eventful year for, for most of us. Uh, I would say we are now living in very challenging times and we can learn to see um, what we didn't expect to see. So what is it that we can glean from this year? What fruits can we harvest from the wealth of experience that we've attained in this unique year. So now more than ever, it's important for us to strengthen our spiritual practice so that we can open the windows of our world to use what is happening so that we can gain insights in this year 2020 and see a bigger picture a reality that extends beyond the superficial or the conventional. So I'd like to welcome Will Meacham to begin this day with his insights. And Will teaches body awareness at the College of Marin and his classes promotes a self understanding through a combination of biological imagery, guided mindfulness, uh, Will's teaching is informed by four decades of psychological and spiritual exploration, undergraduate studies of field biology, graduate work in biophysics and neuroscience, and experience as an acupuncturist. He's also worked six years as an instructor at Niroga Yoga Institute, and he's been a student of Raj Yoga Meditation at the Anabuti Retreat Center for more than 10 years. And Will is a retired ophthalmologist, a surgeon, and he looks forward to helping us discover a spiritual form of 2020 insight. So, Will, the floor is yours. So let me put up uh, a screen here. Okay. By the way, my website is innerlifesupport.com. So when Sister Elizabeth mentioned mindful biology, that was like an earlier incarnation of the whole thing. I'm, I'm now calling it this. I'm not sure this is the last name for it, but it works. And I bring that up partly because what we're looking for here, what I'm looking for and what I'm hoping to share is the sense that within us, life offers a kind of supportiveness. There, there is a life within our bodies that is inherently supportive, inherently potent. And when we can connect with that, we feel more empowered, less stressed, less frightened, and so on. So seeing clearly with mind, heart, and soul. It's not easy to see clearly looking forward. When we all met back in January, you know, some of you were here in January, or you know, we met in person back then, some of you were part of that. I don't think any of us could have looked forward and seen what a you know wreck the year would turn into with COVID and you know, so many needed but you know disruptive social protests. Obviously, very important to have them, uh, but you know there was just a huge amount of stress and trauma as we try to deal with all of the difficulties that confront us as a nation as a civilization. And, and some of it is hopeful, but much of it is you know, difficult because there's a lot of resistance to change, et cetera. And then of course, this really odd and seemingly interminable election drama that even after it's resolved, you know, we're still dealing with some unresolved 
aspects of it, et cetera. You know, we could not have seen or foreseen all of that back in January. But here we are, you know, at the other end, having dealt with it in various ways. And hopefully most of us have, or all of us have some helpful tools in our little spiritual toolkit. And what I'm going to share in this talk, which will last about 40 minutes, hopefully a little less than that, are just a few of my own spiritual tools. And I don't share them because I think they're the best, uh, but only because they're the ones I know. And then later we'll all have an opportunity to share whatever works for us individually, as in, you know, in our own personal lives. Uh, I have had the advantage of being, you know, forewarned and thinking about what are my spiritual tools for several weeks now. Uh, some of you, you know, may be a little bit more on the spot, uh, having to, to look back and say, well, what did work for me? But I'm sure we all had something that worked. So seeing clearly with mind, you know, what is the mind? I've always liked this quote by Emily Dickinson, the brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease and you beside. You know, the idea here is that the mind is innately spacious. It has a built-in capacity to hold what amounts to an infinite amount of material, sense of space and time, etc. And that can be a real advantage when we deal with difficulty, to have that spaciousness of mind. And so here we are, each of us individuals, you know, moving through life. And hopefully each of us is maintaining a spaciousness of mind and we're sharing a space as well. We're inhabiting a shared space. That's, you know, the idea. We fly freely but together. Unfortunately, what often happens to us is we confine ourselves. We don't feel so spacious. We don't feel so connected. We feel small and isolated. It can be compared to what happens to molecules in a gas that's compressed. When there's high compression, the molecules bounce around very rapidly. There's a lot of agitation, but when the space increases, when there's more spaciousness, the molecules move more slowly and more easily. I'm not sure how well this is rendering uh, on your screens, but the idea is that now that everything is open, the molecules flow much more smoothly. And when everything was tight, they were very agitated and jagged. You know, that spaciousness is not necessarily physical. A person can be pretty confined, let's say in a hospital bed, or even in the case of Nelson Mandela, a prison cell. A person could be very confined physically, but have a quite spacious mind. And, and Nelson Mandela is, of course, a good example of someone who endured you know, decades of confinement in uh, difficult, oppressive prison conditions, but who was able to develop and maintain a very impressive spaciousness of mind. And indeed, most of us are not in a hospital bed or in a prison cell. In fact, none of us today are. The confinement that we experience is a confinement that we construct for ourselves. We put ourselves in little bottles and boxes because of what we've been told or what we've endured and so on. And you know, to confine ourselves a little bit from time to time is not a bad thing, but to confine ourselves a lot, most of the time, you know, does begin to really detract from our quality of life. It would be as if the birds in this flock just stayed stuck together, all conglomerated in one place and never moved. You, know, you wouldn't notice it if it lasted a half a second, but if it started to last for minutes, it would begin to look very unnatural. As I said at the outset, you know, feelings and life change. That's the nature of the experience. And so artificially restricting it leads to discomfort, leads to more than discomfort, a sense of loss of vitality, you could say. 
right? I mean, none of this is surprising. I'm just kind of stating the obvious here. You know, so how do we maintain that spaciousness of mind? That's, I think, really the key issue. And, and I have a few practices for it that I'd like to share, you know, having kind of set that stage. One is to look at things over a long span of time. So here is what I think is a pretty interesting graphic of the world history timeline on all continents. And it shows, you know, in a very abbreviated and summarized view, like the rise and fall of major movements, empires, uh, religious advancement, and so on over centuries. And so you can see, you know, empires come and go, nations rise and fall, et cetera. And if we zeroed in on any century or any decade, we might see wars and famines. We'd see, you know, all sorts of uproars, epidemics, plagues, uh, natural disasters, huge earthquakes, volcanoes, you know, all of those things happened over the span of the last 5,000 years. And of course, relative to the span of life on earth, which has gone back billions of years, even the little human story of 5,000 years or so you know, of recorded history, it's just, a, it's just a speck of time. So here we are in, at the end of 2020, having gone through what seems like a lot of uproar, but it would barely register on this world history timeline. When another thousand years go by, it's pretty likely that COVID won't even, you know, be a big enough of a blip to actually be worth filling in on this graph, right? Feels big right now, but with a larger perspective, it may look relatively small. That's, a, that's an open spacious time perspective, an open spacious perspective in terms of distance or actual physical space is something you can get by looking down on the earth in a satellite photo, such as we're looking at here. So I'm in uh, Marin County, north of San Francisco. This is the San Francisco Bay Area. I think most of us are somewhere near this region, not all though. But just using it as an example, from this distance, I look down there, I, I can kind of see where my house would be located, but I certainly can't see my individual place of residence. And I don't know what day this picture was acquired on, but I, whatever it was, whatever I was doing that day, you know, I might've been having a really bad day, but you can't see it from up here. It's a safe bet that on this particular day, at this particular instant, someone down there in that area of, you know, urban expansion with some six or 7 million people, someone down there was probably suffering acute grief. They'd lost a parent or a child or a spouse. And to them, this might've been the worst moment of their life. It's pretty likely that somewhere in all of that, someone was really suffering with some terrible grief. And it's pretty likely that someone else was experiencing some tremendous joy, a new baby, a new job, right? So all of that human activity is going on down there. But if you're looking at it from 100 miles up, it doesn't really register. You only get the big picture, the overview. So kind of drawing back the lens away from our personal little story, from our little immediate surroundings and the people that we know directly and starting to take in a bigger picture allows the mind to expand in that spacious way. So I'd like to just lead, if you'll indulge me, a little bit of a guided meditation to kind of encourage that. And like I say, this is to show some examples of ways that I work with the difficulties of this year, because these are, these are my actual practices. And so finding a comfortable posture, whatever that might be for you, but hopefully one where you feel supported and also alert. The eyes can be open or closed. It might work a little better this particular meditation with eyes closed, but that's not essential. And first begin by feeling the support of the earth below, coming up through your feet, through your thighs, your sitting bones, whatever furniture is supporting you. Just feeling that support from below. And then getting a sense of your body's location in the room. You know, like where it is, how is it extending in space? 
So you kind of have a sense of where the front of your body is and the back, the two sides, the top of your head. And this is where you are, so to speak, right now in this space. And then after you get a really strong sense of just occupying your position right here, right now, imagine a somewhat different perspective. So imagine that you could move your mind's eye up to the ceiling above you. Or if you wish, imagine that there's a little camera up there and you're just looking at the display in front of you. So there's this view that's available looking down on your body from a couple of feet above your head. So you've got this felt sensation of where your body is, but you're also aware there's another viewpoint, one above. And then move that viewpoint up above the roof of whatever building you're in. Maybe 50 feet, 100 feet above. So you're looking down on that building and you're seeing whatever vegetation surrounds the building, whatever other buildings might be in the neighborhood, streets. So there's a viewpoint from there, a bird flying overhead would look down and see something different than what you see when you look around the room with your body's eyes. You're now looking down on the building with your mind's eye, just imagining. So you don't see your body from up here, you see the building that you're in. And you probably don't see too many of the people around you. But you see what contains them. And you could move up higher so that maybe you're taking in the whole neighborhood now. Looking down all the people that live around you or work around you. Some you know, some you don't. Most of them in their own buildings, doing their own things, living their own lives with their own concerns. Just like you. Going up higher still until you're about as high as that satellite picture now, way up high above the whole area in which you reside, whatever metropolitan region that is, whatever part of whatever nation, whatever continent. If you live in the Bay Area, then you've got that image in memory, looking down and right now, there is that viewpoint available too. A weather balloon up that high could snap a picture. And from up there, you wouldn't see even your own neighborhood. And whatever concerns, physical issues, emotional problems, you or your loved ones might be suffering, those would be kind of washed out by this vast amount of human existence that fills the whole area, not to mention the existence of all the other creatures. Pleasure and pain, sorrow and joy, success and failure, gain and loss, etc. From this remo remove, it all is kind of one big drama. And imagine now as you're up there that the clock starts to move backwards and you're looking down on that area and you're going back 5,000 years. Very few places on the planet have any human structures that are that old, that are visible from space, if any. So a couple hundred, two, three hundred generations ago, it was just earth, just nature. That's not that long ago. And then just let your attention slide back down till you're just above the roof of your building. 
and then just below the ceiling. And then come fully back with complete awareness into this physical body that you inhabit on a moment by moment basis. This isn't about leaving our bodies as a form of escape. It's just reminding ourselves that there are so many other viewpoints, so many other ways of seeing things, some of them with a much larger expanse of time and space. Just to encourage that spaciousness of mind. Of course, you could just sit still and allow the, the mind to expand naturally as well. That happens. But sometimes if there's a lot of thought content, an exercise like this can be useful and I find it so. So rather than plowing ahead, I, I sort of plan to just keep going, but that seems like that was a lot. So I'm gonna stop the screen share for a second. And just see, is there anything that needs to be said? Anything that anybody wants to comment on after that before we you know, plow through and, and I bore you further with more, with more images and language. Was that helpful? I see some nodding heads. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good. All right. Can we raise hands? You can raise hands. You can use a little device to raise hands or just raise your actual human hand. You can hear me? I hear you, Dave. Oh, hey, Will. <laughs> nice to be here. Good to have you. I just, I just want to say, yeah, it's very helpful. Really enjoy the images, the imaging, and the big picture really helps, especially being stuck in this not so healthy body these days. So thank you for that. Okay, good. I'm glad it helps. Thank you. Yes, Jita. Um, it is very helpful and it's very familiar to me because when I meditate, I usually expand, try to expand my vision physically. I look at the area around me. I start with myself, my room, my home, and then outside, and then wider and wider. And we imagine like the whole globe or earth. So, but I don't do it for feeling insignificant. But now when I did that, I felt almost invisible, like speck of dust like thing. So my problems, my own self is not important at all. Yes. Though it is yes. important to me right now, yes. Right, important to you, but on the big scheme, none of us is that important. And so that's exactly the practice. It sounds yes. like you are familiar with it. So thank you. Mark, hi. Yeah, well, first of all, <laughs> on a very superficial level, simple level, I'm, I'm just very happy to see you, Will. Will and I worked together at Kaiser for many, many years and had a lot of a lot of smiles and laughter together. And it's really nice to see Elizabeth and reminds me of all the interfaith council retreats that we have at Anabuti. So if I had, didn't say thank you enough in the past, I'm thanking you again for, for all of your generosity. Um, I think, well, what an interesting comment you made when you, were, you did that image from up above and you say, you know, some people are suffering, some people are having joy, right? It's like the 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. And whenever I would leave Kaiser, there would always be some people talking outside, talking about grandma in the in the ICU. And I always think every day, if, if, if your family's doing okay, someone else is struggling with a, you know, illness and disease. It's just the nature of life. And so that leaves me with the sense of always treat people with compassion because you don't know uh, what, what suffering is happening, you know, behind the, 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 their, the, with their world. Anyway, it's nice to be here. Thank you, Will, and uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Mark. That's very helpful. Okay, I don't, I'm not seeing any other hands. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll move on to the next little bit.
So, and next it's seeing with the heart. That's, I'm changing the order slightly, but uh, we're getting to all three components, heart, mind, and soul. So we're familiar with this symbol, very familiar, I think. This kind of Valentine heart, which is a stand in for this idea that we connect with other people uh, through love. And there's another image that can be thought of when the word heart is used, and that's something like this, the, the anatomical pump, which is also about connection. Uh, the heart pumps blood through the entire body, so it connects one part of the body with every other part. It also pumps blood through the lungs, so it connects our bodies with the atmosphere. And of course, the atmosphere has oxygen in it because there are plants that produce that oxygen, etc. So the heart, in the Valentine sense, connects us with love, and in the anatomical sense, connects us with life. And, and I think there's you know, considerable overlap between these two. It's not like one or the other. I don't think it's a coincidence that we use the same word for both meanings. So along those lines, this is data from the famous Framingham Heart Study, which has now been going on for, I think, 70 years. And part of the title was the dynamic spread of happiness in a large social network. And the idea is that what they've mapped here are the social connections of individuals. So each little circle and square in there is a person. And it just shows like the people that are in their family and their immediate closest friends and coworkers. And they did a statistical analysis where they analyzed everybody's level of happiness. And on this graph, happy is shown as yellow and less happy is shown as blue and green is kind of intermediate. And what they showed statistically, and I think it's even visible in this picture, is that there's clustering. So that if the people that you know are mostly happy, that happiness is kind of contagious. And if the people that you know are mostly unhappy, likewise. And, you know, of course, it's not that simple. It could be that, you know, one family is, you know, struggling financially, and so they're just having a hard time. If, you know, that's not just contagion. That's like actual real circumstances, real difficulties. But I think we all realize, you know, I think we naturally are drawn to happier people because we feel happier when we're with them. And, uh, and so there is this sense in which our social connections bring us a quality of joy, uh, especially when they're joyous. Nothing, nothing too surprising there. But what it shows is that we can support one another. Again, no surprise. And so we can help deal with difficult experiences like we've had this year by strengthening and remembering our connections with the human community, especially those connections that feel supported, that enhance well-being. So that's you know, connection with others. What about connection with life? You know, that other meaning of the word heart. Well, you know, here's a picture of the tree of life, the evolutionary family tree of life that begins with some bacterial forms shown in that little circle down toward the bottom, which is of course, you know, we're talking there about trillions upon trillions of individual organisms, but it's represented by just that one region. And humans are, you know, sort of arrogantly placed at the top of the graph, but they don't have any real special location in the overall scheme of evolution. They're just another life form. And then we have all the other millions upon millions of plants and animals and so on, all the different species. And we're all part of this one family of life. And not only are we related, but all of those life forms are interacting. And some are predator species and some are prey species and some are primary producers, you know, like plants. And all of them, when they die, contribute to soil that leads to the growth of new plants. And they're all you know, using oxygen, et cetera, or you know, most of them are using oxygen. And we get this very complex web of life that's superimposed on the incredibly complex tree of life. And that can be a lot of complexity, but then we walk out into nature and we don't see all the complexity that's not at the forefront of our experience. Something else comes forth, this sense of beauty, the sense of supportiveness, the sense of ancient you know, kind of natural wisdom. 
And it's then that we begin to feel connected with life or as you might say, the ecological community. Okay. So I could have just shown a picture of a nice natural environment and, and left it at that, but it's kind of useful, I think, to understand what's behind it, how much is going on behind the scenes of every beautiful landscape that we visit in order to find comfort and support. You know, I've used this analogy in some of my classes before, so some of you probably heard it, but I sometimes approach life like, I feel like I'm a leaf, a little leaf out at the end of a twig. And if I look out away from the, the twig that I grew out of, it looks very scary out there. You know, like it wouldn't take much for me to fall off, to get wiped out. You know, I'm all alone, I'm isolated. It's really easy to forget that, that, that that's actually a, a delusion. So here's this famous quote of John Muir's, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So that means we too, as organisms, are hitched to everything in the universe. And, and I try to remind myself of that. So that rather than being a little leaf out at the end of a tiny little twig looking out on a great big scary world, I look back into the tree itself and into the roots themselves, you know, into, the, into the source of life. You know, not my individual expression of it, but, but what led to it and what supports it. And there's always a huge amount. And once I remember what is generating life and is behind it, then there's a feeling of courage. You know, rather than that scared, anxious, you know, all alone in the world feeling, there's this sense of, oh yes, you know, I'm part of something much bigger than myself. So I'll lead another little meditation. This is just another one of my practices to kind of focus on this heart quality of connection. And so once again, I invite you uh, to find your comfortable posture, supported and alert. And once again, feel the press of the floor, the support of the floor from below through your feet, your thighs, your sitting bones, etc. Once again, inhabit your space in the room, feeling your body, noticing that there's a front to it and a back, and a left side and a right. And there's a top of your head. And so you have a sense of your personal space here in the room. And then allow your attention to focus a little bit more on the mid chest. So going to that space behind the front of the body and in front of the back of the body, between the two sides, the deep interior of the chest. And somewhere in there, there's your heart. And somewhere in there, there are lungs and somewhere in there, there's this feeling of connection. This is where we tend to feel our connections. So first develop that sense of being connected to this body right now. You're really in it. It's really here. It is breathing. It is supporting you. Whatever food you have eaten recently is being digested, providing energy for your experience. Your bones are strong, they're holding you up. Your muscles. Feeling that connection with the physical living body, this product of nature. And then think of someone very dear to you. Could be even an animal, could be a spouse, it could be a child, a sibling, a parent, or a very dear friend, but somebody who's really one of the most important beings in your life. 
someone that you really know cares about you, wants well, wants you to do well, wants you. We go to be with that. And You're muted, Will. Yeah, can you unmute yourself, Will? How long have I been muted? About uh, half a minute. Oh, okay. I don't know why that happened. Okay. So I uh, draw your attention into your chest, into that part of the body that resonates with others, that fuels joy and sorrow. It feels love. And bring to mind a dear being, someone that means a lot to you. It could be an animal, it could be a spouse or a child or a parent or a dear friend, etc. Somebody that you know cares a lot for you. I was just saying that for me, it's my little dog, Ralphie. He's right next to me now. And when I glance over at him, I feel my heart light up a little bit. But even if I just hold an image of him in my mind, I feel like there's a tendril that connects me to him. And so I just kind of savor that connection. Feel it. And I can bring my wife to mind and you can bring another dear one to mind and another tendril of connection. And add in a couple more beloveds, animals, friends, family members, the people closest to you, the beings that matter most in your life. Feel those tendrils from you to them, from them to you, heart to heart. It's easy to feel that heart connection when we're in the presence of a person, but it's possible to feel it just by bringing them into mind. Just keep adding more and more, maybe out into your second tier of support. Your close friends that maybe you've talked to a little less often, but still matter a great deal to you or distant family members, maybe pets that you had years ago that have since departed and you haven't thought about them for a little while, they're still there in your heart. There's still a tendril of connection. So more and more tendrils, like that picture of the Framingham Heart Study, all those relationships, all those connections, heart to heart to heart to heart. And of course, each person that you're connecting with has their own circle of connections, their own web of tendrils. So you're indirectly connected to that web of support as well. And now to another tier, to the people that help you, maybe people that do some work for you, employees, landscapers, people that work at the grocery store, Farmers that prepare the food that you eat, grow and ship it. Builders that built the dwelling that you're in, even if you never met them, they, they exist. There's a supportiveness there and you can notice there's a little tendril of appreciation that goes out that way too. Like, thank you for building this house. Thank you for growing these vegetables. And historical figures that inspire you, I, I think of Nelson Mandela, others, very inspiring people, spiritual leaders, teachers, some that we've met, some we've never met, tendrils going out from heart to heart. 
all the life forms, all the forests and the plankton that generate all the oxygen in the earth. The web of life itself, the planet itself, heart to heart to heart, all this support. Feeling nature alive within one's body, within all bodies, across the surface of the planet. Connected. And I'm gonna go ahead, that's the last meditation I'm gonna lead, so I'll just present a few more slides so we don't get too far behind schedule. We're doing just fine, Will. Oh, okay, well, good. But I wanna move ahead and do the, the soul. So here we are with this little critter up in the tree, looking down, noticing that there's an entire tree he, I use the word he because I'm really referring to myself here. He is not alone. He is not isolated. He is not as vulnerable as he thought. He's got this entire tree that's generating life. But there's another layer that's not quite so visible, this depth, this root to the tree. And that's what I think of as the soul, the more hidden piece, the part that's not obvious. It's like when you look at a volcano, an enormous amount of power and vitality, energy. And that seems to be sufficient in itself. And you look at a person, especially a person that's you know, fully occupying their being and not you know, too self-denying, and you get that sense of like, that person is a power to be reckoned with. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, a negative thing. It's like, this is a creative power. Wow. Thank goodness this person is here. But it's easy to neglect the fact that there's some deeper energy that's feeding in to that volcano and into every person. Something not so apparent. In the case of the volcano, it's huge channels and lakes of underground liquid rock going all the way down into the mantle and core of the earth. And the volcano is really just a little blip on the top of all that. And so when you start to look down at those depths, you're encountering something even more profound. And of course you could keep going with that. You could say, well, that planet grew out of you know, it's the fourth or fifth generation of stars since the galaxy was formed and the galaxy itself has a history, etc. You know, where did this all come from? What is behind it all? You know, so we look at life and, and sometimes we just want to tell it to stop because we're afraid, you know, it's like, I can't take all this. It's too much to worry about COVID and creeping authoritarianism or whatever else the fears might be, you know, overpopulation, climate change, uh, you know, you name it. And you just, sometimes you just want to like hold up your hand and just say, you know, give me a break. I just can't take all this. Not to mention the physical pain, you know, the, the fear of aging, of losing the people we care most about, et cetera. And that comes from that small consciousness, that idea that I'm just a leaf here. I mean, that's really the source of the fear, is the forgetting of the larger story. You know, going back to Buddhist thought, I mean, there is another way of holding up the hand in the face of the onslaught. Not saying, you know, stop because I'm too afraid, but like, I'm witnessing this you know, hold, I will respond. You know, the fearless 
gesture, as opposed to the, as opposed to the feared, the fearful one. Now that comes from what could be called soul consciousness. It could be called any number of things, but a sense of something, of being something bigger and stronger than one little individual. Because for sure, if all we look at is our individual body and our individual well-being, it's frightening. The body is vulnerable. Everything we care about is vulnerable. It's all transient. It's all gonna you know, decay and fall away with time. Of course, that's frightening. Not to mention the political situation and you know, the global situation and so on. The only way we really can stand with a sense of solidity and genuine courage is to take those bigger views, the more spacious views, the more connected views. And in particular, to go really into the depths. Because even the planet itself is temporary. It's, you know, at some point, the sun will expand into a red giant. And when that happens, the whole orbit of Earth will be encompassed within the star itself. Earth will end. But reality will continue. The cosmos, in some form, will continue. You know? So we look at those deeper, deeper, deeper roots of things. When we can stay rooted like that, we do have this sense of stability and like, yes, it's all hard and, and yes, it, a lot of it hurts. And, and sure, there's also joy too, but the joys are always, you know, tinged with a sense of like they're going to end. But we can be stable in the midst of all that as long as we feel rooted. At Anya Bodhi, they talk about you know, the spiritual powers of love, bliss, purity, peace, and power. And these are roots. Each one of those is like a root that helps us maintain that kind of stability. And then there are all these names, you know, Baba, God, Allah, Yahweh, you know, for these religious ideas that point to this deep rootedness. And then there are less religious terms like natural laws, grounded being, great spirit, mystery, you know, a little more ambiguous. But there's that sense, whatever the name, of something deeper, right? And getting rooted in that feeling, and it's not really even developing roots, it's noticing the roots that are already present. You know, we grew out of the cosmos. We grew out of those four or five generations of stars. We grew out of the galaxy, out of the earth. The roots are actually there, we just forget. We grew out of natural laws. We grew out of whatever universal intelligence is behind and, in, and around and you know, pervades all of this. So the meditation, which I won't leave because I think we'll have other opportunities for it, would be to grow rooted in source. We, we can come back to that later. I wanted to close instead with a poem that I found just today uh, in the New York Times. I was gonna use one of my own, which I've actually I think, <coughs> used before. Sister Elizabeth pointed that out to me. I don't have that many good ones. So rather than using, trotting out my old standby, I thought I'd use this one, which I think is actually better anyway. And it's called A Life Unlived. And I actually can't read the poet's name because on my screen it's blocked right now, um, but you can read it. And the idea is, there was an interview with her. Actually, I think she wrote the article and then added the poem that this is about two brothers that are watching a, a, a stage play and they're having a conversation. And this is just the first part of the poem, but it captures kind of what I'm trying to get at here. So an open air stage, dawn. All movements keep the beat, a fixed choreography. The dancers are dancing. Ballet. A man holds a clock. In the end, all we hear is the clock's ticking. A transition from the dancer's choreographed movements to the clock's simple ticking. I have asked for a new age to begin here among us. Lightning strikes, shows itself. You may choose one piece of knowledge to take with you, just one. You may choose as you see fit the freedom is yours. But if limitations are what you want, they're available. Wind the clock. What will die becomes a beginning. Leave everything. 
My memories? Yes, them too. Remembering won't be possible. You die. We all die. Just like that? Yes, in a way. In a way, not. You won't be able to choose when, but it will happen. What do you know of the new age? You do have experience. What you see in front of you. It's no use being afraid. Good, good, that's right. Greet the new with confidence. Be fair. Who are you, the one who will explain it all to us? Never, no such thoughts. Change the melody and listen to what is barely audible. Thank you, Will. You're welcome. It's, it's that last line in particular, to listen to what is barely audible. And maybe as we close here for this little talk, we can just go back into that silence for a minute or so and just see what is barely audible, deep in the body, deep in the mind, deep in the heart, deep in the soul. Thank you, Will. What you shared really creates space for me. And um, it's lovely how we don't realize how powerful a tool our heart is. It has its own intelligence, its intuitive nature. And also, um, it's amazing what is apparent when we settle the mind. I mean, there's so much accessible to us. Um, so it's um, it's lovely to. Um, I'm, I mean, I really appreciate you sharing some tools and some ideas on how we can um, access those tools, abilities, the heart, and to cool the mind. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to take this time for a more personal reflection. And um, we have a half hour together now till we go for a break. And um, let's take this time to look back on 2020. And, um, you know, we can feel safe in this moment to sort of reflect on perhaps a challenge that's uh, came up for us. And it could be something um, it doesn't have to be a monumental challenge for the sake of this exercise that we'll do together um, personally, but also collectively. But to take a moment and look back at 
a situation or circumstance in this year that came up for you. Um, it, it was my mother passed away this year. Um, the um, our director of the West Coast had gone through a triple bypass and um, and then a stroke a few months later. And the kind of feelings that came up for me. And initially you go into responsibility mode and perhaps didn't get a chance to listen to um, the messages of the heart and actually the tools that are ready to be used um, that are natural for you or for me, actually, if I were to make it personal. And I have a few questions and perhaps you could, if you have a piece of paper and pen, this will be helpful. And we'll go on this journey together to dip into this well of experience. We've been witnessed to not only our personal journey, but also perhaps it might have been um, a challenge in observing the collective journey. And it may have triggered some um, uncertainty or difficulty or uncomfortableness um, or fear within. So first question is what is one difficult circumstance that you faced this year? And write that down. Just pick one. And probably the first one that comes to mind is the one that will be perfect for this exercise. So it's a situation that you faced any time during this 2020 experience. And when you think of that situation or that circumstance, what negative habit of thinking came up for you? So when you were facing this circumstance, what negative happen, ha, uh, habit of thinking um, that you observed such as, oh, this is really bad, or this is, an un, this is unfair. Why is this happening to me? Or I don't like you, or I don't like this person. Oh gosh, this person again. Or um, this is, uh, I just can't handle this. I just can't handle it. This is too much. Or what's going to happen in the future? So any of this kind of along these lines of, of chatter that you've observed in your mind that came up while while witnessing or experiencing this situation. And just jot down a few of those thoughts. We're going somewhere with this. And I don't know about you, I had thought of something as I, I, you know, verbalized the questions with you and it's sort of tugging at my heart 
as if it's saying, uh, excuse me, um, are you ready to listen to me now? <laughs> and I don't know what, let's see. Um, and so the third question, so in response to this negative chatter or energy, which was probably very uncomfortable or maybe even painful, out of that, perhaps in the stillness, what quality or new habit can I glean from this situation? Maybe it's a virtue, a strength, or a new perspective. So what new habit of thinking or new perspective, virtue, quality, did you create that was new within you from this experience? So in using the example I just offered, um, my mother passed away in April and Sister Chandru had a triple bypass in July. And these matriarchs in my life are now needing my assistance or my care and whatever negative or fearful thoughts that could come from that. Now, what can I do? Now, what do I do? I'm on my own here. You know, that could be the way thinking. And then the new thought, the new perspective. Now it's time to be a support for others. And to really take support from my own personal divine reference. And for me, it's God. And make that divine presence my maternal connection. Wow. <laughs> so that really speaks to my heart right now. So that would be what I gleaned um, from that experience. So it's, it's an internal discovery, right? Dis uncovery, I should say. <laughs> and so from that, perhaps you did do something new in order to deal with that situation. Okay. All right. And last question. Now, how has your life improved because you went through this situation? So how has it affected your life now? So for me, the thought was I can breathe. And I'm more available for others. So I put these questions also in the chat because uh, now I'm going to um, break us up into different chat rooms so that we can take this time to share this, um, I'm gonna call it a new word, this uncovery, <laughs> this journey, this uh, 
this uh, or discover discovery or of uh, your personal appreciative inquiry process. And I'm just going to make sure each room has. I'm Peg. Um, Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> hi, Peg. Um, hi, I just wanted to jump in for a second and say thank you to Audrey, who was our partner. And we got a little cut off at the end because we weren't done with the three of us. But um, we did. I feel badly about that. <laughs> that's OK. Um, I think that for me, what was um, kind of a highlight uh, or theme of all of our sharing was that um, no matter what difficult situation, in our case, we were talking about health issues somewhat, um, someone's going through staying in the present and um, being grateful for basically for life and health, whatever health you do have, starting wherever that is, um, is really a positive way to uh, get through things. And um, yeah, just staying in the present and always uh, looking at what's positive in that moment. So Yeah, that's very deep. And I often ask myself, can, how can I maintain that perspective so that while I'm going through something, um, I haven't yet achieved that yet, <laughs> but I have noticed with practice that the recovery is a lot shorter. Yeah. And maybe, maybe you have that experience. It's not so. Right. You know, forever and I think period. one of the things that we were talking about too, is just your own mind chatter, you know, like how do you, how do you um, how do you ease yourself out of the familiar um, messaging? You know, sometimes negative messaging that you get in your head, and how do you how do you um, find little ways to find yourself in it? You know, how do you be mindful enough to know that it's happening and to pull yourself out? You know, to reach down for I think you know, one of the roots in the ground and Whoa. to have that courage to say, okay, let me just try thinking about this a different way. You know, sometimes it takes that cognitive shift, you know, that you have to sort of force it. And then, you know, by reaching down into the ground for at least, you know, like, well, like you're talking about tendrils, you know, reach for a tendril of a root and just grab that and hold on and, you know, and then maybe do a meditation or at least just follow your thoughts a little bit so that you can sort of see how this chatter is, is actually not helping and, you know, reaching out and trying something else in the moment. When it's not possible to stop that chatter, and right? sometimes, you know, we can stop it temporarily, of course, but it usually okay. revs itself back up again if it's really strong. You know, another tactic, of course, is to uh, just disidentify from it. Like there's that chatter, but there's a lot more going on in my sphere of experience. Sometimes I'll, when the chatter is loud and I can't really do much with it, I'll like notice that, well, it's not over here in my hand, right? And it's not in my feet. It's, it's some localized loop of a pattern of some sort that's going around and around here. And just that little bit of like noticing that it's not everything, yeah. uh, it can be helpful. Thank you, Audrey. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I will. Thanks again, Audrey. You will. Nice to see you. <laughs> Anyone else?
I'd just like to uh, add uh, my own thoughts or feelings and, and that's uh, uh, I'm very grateful to know and appreciate the friendship of Will in my life. We've known each other for quite a period of time now from the very get-go of our friendship, as a matter of fact. And um, the quality of my life is better because I know Will. And I wanted to acknowledge Will and uh, express my gratitude. And uh, it's really good to be here today. And it's good to have a friend by the name of Will. I feel the same way, Bob, but thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. It looked like you had your hand up for a second there. Did someone yeah, did raise a hand? hand? Or, or Mark. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try and be really short. I, I was uh, partnered with uh, Nilu, who's in New Jersey, I think she said. I, I just assumed everybody was here in Marin County. Uh, I couldn't pinpoint one thing, Elizabeth, that a personal challenge versus the whole year and watching everything related to the president and his men. And mm -hmm. part, of, part of this was there was so much suffering that was unnecessary. Like a good, good example, after George Floyd, a strong president could have said, this needs to stop. We need to take care of our, our, our African-American community. I mean, there's so many points along the way. All of the masking response, the arrogance of, of not wearing masks, all of this, I, I, a lot of my friends were angry and I found myself more sad because the sadness was like, we can do better than this. So that was my struggle. How do I deal with a world that I want it to be and the world as it is? And so right, my response was instead of when judgment would percolate, I know, well, you know, this, the, ter the terminology of Buddhism, like, you know, judgment, all these emotions are mind states that come and they go. They're not who we are. So when judgment percolates up, I found myself trying to put compassion in its place. So as long as I can put compassion there, then I kind of, I, I could feel that for, for the people that are suffering. But being angry and judgmental is not helpful to me. So that was my way of healing myself. Uh, I know it's a little bit simplistic, but that's, it's been difficult to watch what's gone on this year. And as I told um, Rabbi Stacy at Rodef Shalom, I just said, yeah, my, my challenge is to be, to live more with more equanimity. And that is easier, easier said than done, as you know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I mean, I'm so glad somebody named the white elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, for some, you know, I have my family. I also want to give credit because uh, in case, because there'll be someone on the call that may have a different view of that. And, um, um, just, so just to sort of also respect other points of view too, um, I, in my family, we have a liberal and a conservative, or they like to say traditional um, ethics. And um, I really had to take time and make peace with that mark. And I, what I did for myself was I, um, I went and spent time with this one uncle and he's sort of the patriarch of my father's side of the family. And um, he's very opinionated, but he just turned 90. And I just wanted to, I just listened. And I guess the Buddha way compassionately. And I, I didn't, um, I, just, I just allowed him to flow and be natural in who he was. And then I was able to see that he, he wants the same thing that my liberal father wants. They, he just has a different way of going about it. But anyway, whatever, it really brought me peace. It really brought me peace and um, regard for other viewpoints um, because I also noticed that there's a game in trying to demonize the other. And I try not to uh, let my thought and heart go in that direction and just know have to, I have faith I trust that balance will make its way. Everything wants to come back into balance. And if it's heavy tipped in one end, it, I'm going to be part 
emotionally and vibrationally, I want to be part of the solution. And that's what logically spoke to my heart so that it could calm down. Um, and I mean, that at least that's what worked for me in 2020. So I'm glad, Mark, you, you mentioned something. And I'm sure it's the same for other viewpoints too, because they want peace also. There's one thing that all sides agree on, which is that there's something just not right about the direction of the world right now. Mm -hmm. That's I think right. Get everybody to agree that there is something wrong. Exactly what that thing is and what should be done about it. That's that's where the disagreements come up. But the general sense that there is a problem uh, it seems to be universal, and, and maybe that's our common ground. Yeah. That's Does anybody have a problem Will. hearing hearing Will? I have a problem hearing Will. Yeah, Will, your your volume did kind of go half. Hmm. Let me let me. Is this better? A little bit. Off? Yeah, that was a little better. Thank you. I have you. an external microphone that's supposed to be better than the computers, but maybe that's not true. So let's no, try. No, that's it. good. Okay. Better now. All right. Good. Okay, uh, why don't we take, if, if we may, could we just take a 15 minute break? Is Let's just uh, sit back and I'll guide us on a, a meditation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take a nice deep breath in. Just imagine that you're taking a nice walk out in nature. And you're walking along a river. And the river is flowing very calmly, smoothly. And continuously. And you follow the river and it opens up into a beautiful, pristine mountain lake. And the winds have calmed down. Now just imagine walking towards the shore of this lake as a whole vista opens up for me of trees and hills.
and I find a big rock for me to sit on. And I just take in the beauty and identify myself with this body of water. So much has happened over the centuries to this lake. Yet it still remains calm, cool, welcoming waters and also sharing incoming rivers and streams and outgoing like breathing in and out there's a wealth of experience in the depth of this lake Any disturbances will only uncover its wealth at the bottom and in the beds of this lake are many treasures. I walk to its edge, the beauty of it draws me nearer to itself. And I peer into a pool just beneath my feet. And I notice gems, precious stones, glistening on the floor of this lake. And when I notice one, it attracts the attention to others. And now this lake is shimmering with light from its depths reflecting the light of the sun and giving back through its waters out into the atmosphere. I marvel at the wealth that is waiting for me in the depths of this lake. It's waiting to be observed. and to be experienced. Bringing it into karma actions so that my journey can have light, illumination,
my path, interacting with relationships and roles, people and places. My basket is overflowing. I am full and content. I continue to receive and accept joy and peace into my life. Just as I receive it, I am elated to share this joy. with my roles and relationships, with people and places, with time and matter. I stay in the flow of life. Like my breath and the river and the lake. and time. I accept that peace, that clarity and joy, and I imagine spreading that heartfelt joy out to my family and community, Om Shanti, so you can make your way back to the awareness of the room where you're sitting, <clears throat> and um, welcome back everyone. I just thought to briefly share with you one slide and then um, together we can answer a few questions for um, taking the gleanings, uh, taking what we've, some insights from 2020 and taking these discoveries and how I can use it for the future. And so um, for me, of course, what opens up the heart and cools the mind has always been sort of a, a navigator for me. And um, forgiveness is always a wonderful um, opening and um, tool. I don't even like to call it a tool. I call it a necessity. <laughs> And uh, it's, it's really giving me peace of mind. It's the gift for me, um, forgiveness. And I, I can't relinquish the debt of anyone, anyone's karmic accounts. Um, if I forgive them, they still have a return of of action accordingly or whatever. Um, but 
by forgiving, I clear my path. I clear the heaviness, the resentment, the fear, um, um, whatever might come with that particular um, situation that I'm holding on to. Um, it's almost as if every moment I am allowing it to flow. And so I just want to share one slide with you. This process of flow, you know, um, <clears throat> and to pass through a, a stuck place. And I sort of took out, I took apart forgiveness and this has helped me. And I just called it ASPIRE, you know, an acronym for a process. And so A would be acceptance. You know, it, this is a common knowledge that first you have to uh, acknowledge that there's an issue <laughs> and that there's something that I'm holding on to. Um, and usually I think it's the situation that's causing the disturbance or the person is causing that disturbance um, or my ill feelings but I've yet to see it to be that they are the cause or it is the cause. Um, <clears throat> I've always found a release or a letting go when I'm able to face that and acknowledge um, that I'm actually in the driver's seat with my hands on the wheel and that I accept what I need to learn. I accept the challenge that this is happening. Um, like I said, with my mother, I would say my situation. Um, and to even witness that there was some disappointment and it, for my mother, she's departed, but I, I, I had some unfinished business with her. And um, so, you know, to accept that process and face it, and then once I discovered or uncovered what that was, then I felt a release. And so then the surrender. And it really is to observe or see what the issue is and then naturally to let it go. And um, purpose for me is a living, um, it has its own life. It's like a living entity almost. Um, people often ask, you know, what's my purpose? You know, and they're searching for their purpose. It, it's that gem at the bottom of the lake. And to catch the rays of light emanating from that gem is to catch those things that you're willing to live for or die for. I don't know which is harder <laughs> to live for something, die for something but that you wouldn't hesitate to speak to a group of people about or you know it it has a life of its own and so purpose keeps evolving you know when we're young or you know when we were 10 our purpose was a little different i mean there'll be some threads from our childhood that we that carry us through our life um, of things that we care about, like animals or um, kindness, you know. But as we grow um, into our teens and then into our adulthood and then maturity, um, it keeps evolving. So for me, purpose is, it's, it needs to be revisited. And with each lesson learned, I'm adding uh, a, a deeper or depth to my sense of who I am and my, my existence. Um, and then of course, in that journey, I gain insights. And so I almost thank that situation for blessing me with some insights. Uh, often I tell, you know, students or friends, I like to call them my friends, my colleagues, um, you know, why, why do we have to wait till after we've passed a situation to appreciate 
what I've learned from it. Because when I'm in it, you do everything in your power to eliminate it, get rid of it. This shouldn't be happening. Put on the brakes. But of course, the um, insights come later on. And um, release is a little different than surrender. For me, surrender is, is uh, accepting something higher, something at a higher frequency, something that vibrates um, with a more divine kind of feeling um, or a, um, it's me. I feel that it's surrendering to a greater good. Um, and then release is to let go of the toxin, to let go of the old, the waste thoughts. And then empower or evolve. I, I often look at this whole process like a trapeze artist. And there are many life changes that we go through. In a day, you could even say we go through a lot of changes. Um, but certainly in this year, and um, it could be graduating from college, it could be getting married, it could be your children have uh, grown and are moving out and making their own lives, these, these sort of transitions. And to go through this breathing or aspire <laughs> to uh, accept, surrender, um, find depth, gain insights, to let go of the waste, you know, like any system, it lets go of its waste and um, move on. And so that trapeze artist has to let go of its trapeze, that inert energy that brings it to the next ex life experience. Oh, now I have to retire. Now who am I? And then I let go of that trapeze and then the timing of what happens next is to grab hold of the next trapeze. But there's this brief moment where I'm not holding on to the old paradigm or the trapeze or, or the old experience or role or relationship. And before I bring on to the new role relationship, um, there's this moment where I'm neither this nor that. And it can be quite chaotic. It can be excruciating when we're in that moment. And that's where the resistance comes. And I just breathe with it and just know that this is a window of opportunity where the ahas come. And I sometimes I humor it by if I resist the next shift in my life or what is happening, if I'm resisting, then I will, instead of it being an aha or ah, it'll be a ah, you know, as if I'm falling, you know, it just feels so painful. And I fall into a pit of despair or hopelessness or fear or, or resentment. Um, but to take that moment as a glimpse of um, reuniting my identity to that soul conscious state um, that Will was referring to earlier in the program. And it's bodiless, it's weightless, it's consciousness. It's awe. You know, Allah, Jehovah. Buddha, um, it's, it's that divine wonderment when I'm loosened from one identity and I'm ready to embrace the next. Um, and so anyway, I've used this model to, to guide my way through. And so I thought I would um, take this opportunity to take our journey and jot down um, in our journals uh, some answers to these two questions. And um,
So if you could get your pad of paper and just ponder this and think about what quality or virtue that you would like to develop in the time that's remaining in 2020. So today is December 5th and we have 25 days left. So what quality or virtue would I like to develop further within myself? And this could be something that you gleaned from your, your inquiry in the uh, first session or something new. Most probably they'll be connected. But what would I, what strength or ability or virtue quality would I like to develop in the time that's remaining in 2020? What am I going to bring with me for the new year? And then secondly, How will this quality or ability improve my life? Or the quality of my life? Or my perception of my life? How will this new strength, virtue, ability, bring quality to my life. So I had used these two matriarchs in my life and the big shift that they can no longer play that role for me and what I took from that experience is that I spiritually connect and take the divine mother energy in, in my meditations and to begin to be uh, of support in a maternal way, but take a, that support maternally from the divine and then also giving that to step up. And so what quality I would probably take from that is integrity. That speaks to me right now. To be honest with myself. And to quote something that Will had said the other day that, you know, to be, to discover myself as a gift and um, the gift of life. And to be honest with that gift, for me, that's integrity. So I, I, I'm going to remove all spotlights and now we're just one nice big family here. And um, mm -hmm. uh, Connie, any any insights? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, yes. Um, and when I say this, it makes me nervous because I'm asking for the quality, uh, or actually virtue of patience, and I know from past experience, when I've asked for that, I get a whole lot of things to practice with. <laughs> so, but that is, that is something that I would really like to deepen in myself so that I may have more ease and peacefulness in, in all of my experiences, yeah. 
Thank you. Yes, Peg. Oh, hi. Um, I was going to say thank you for that, Connie, because I was first I was going to say patience. And then I realized what I really want is to not judge my impatience. So I really want less self judgment mm. and um, more mm. self acceptance. Mm. And I think what that would do for me would be allow me just to have more self acceptance, more self love, um, more acceptance of my normal human uh, moods and, and um, imperfections, I guess. Yeah. Thank you, Peg. That felt, it feels really nice too, actually, those, both those offerings. And um, because it's kind of, uh, sometimes we, for me, I'm just sharing from my insight on that is to have patience with the process even. Oh, it's not happening yet. Why haven't I become, you know, <laughs> my integrity? Oops, I didn't, that was, didn't really maintain my integrity there or, and to be patient with that or to be okay with it. Thanks. Jeffrey? Yes, um, where I went to was that um, I have an issue with a son who I have hurt feelings with. And I realize that I get hurt feelings a fair amount of the time. And um, so what I'm, I realize is that um, I, I go to where I'm hurt. I have hurt feelings and um, kind of what I call being uber sensitive. And so I'm, I'm really thinking about the, the deeper aspect of letting go instead of holding on because I like to hold on and it serves no purpose whatsoever except for my ego. And I need to keep letting go and keep letting go and keep letting go. And where the bottom line to me is just being kind to myself, you know, in, instead of getting a payout, you know, from, from massaging my ego is just keep letting go, being present and being kind and being kinder yet, and then being even deeper, kinder. Thank you. Wow. Yes, Mark. Uh, sort of following what Connie said is my my place is like I would I would like to have more calmness more of the time, and I remember I start off in the middle of the year and um, Annie from the Kamaris was was at one of our uh, word meetings, and I said you know I just have to make an effort to sit more often. And Annie said, yeah, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> but I do know that if I take more of an effort to sit, um, I, I know this sounds really corny, but I think all these things that we're talking about come, come about naturally. The calmness starts coming back, the patience, the compassion. And then as Will showed that slide with all these interconnections, inter then I find that I'm in the world with that kind of calmness and that spreads to people that I meet like hiking up in the hills and you can have that kind of engagement. So that's where I would like to be more often. And I think if I sit a little more often, which I haven't been sitting as much as I should, um, I think that would be a good start for a good start for the end of this year, as you said, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you, Mark. Audrey? Um, I'm nodding my head because, Mark, I, I completely agree with you um, about just uh, just doing the sitting. And the weeks that I do it, it it's so obvious that, you know, the, the self-judgment or the shame or, you know, any of these things that I struggle with um, are just so much more in perspective. And... Uh, and, and I just feel so much more of a flowing human being, you know, so that 
I, um, yeah, and you know, and, and then I guess I, uh, I'd like to even get rid of my, um, my self-criticism for not singing enough. <laughs> and what was the last bit? What? Sorry, I'm just laughing because, you know, it's like, it's, you know, and then as I'm talking, I feel the self-criticism for not sitting enough, right? So just, you yeah. know, okay. letting go, mm -hmm. letting go. Yeah. And just the importance, just the, the simple importance of what that does. Thank you. Yes, Will? Is that Will? Who did? Yeah, you go ahead, please point someone at Will. You're, and your voice is a little low again. Is that better? Uh, was that Ellie? Did you, did you, who? Yeah, Ellie had her hand up. You need to unmute yourself, Ellie, but you can go ahead. You just unmute me. There you go. Okay, sorry. Okay, um, it's almost an oxymoron that I'm saying this, but what I'd like to embrace is more stillness um, for a variety of reasons when, as opposed to sitting, for me, it's just stillness. It allows me uh, to have a better perspective more open perspective, compassion, understanding, forgiveness of myself, others, all of those things become so much more amplified when I'm still. And so the flow is much smoother and it's just uh, more natural and even. And that was something I wanted to work on uh, moving down here. Um, because we all have things that we believe in and whether it's you know, might is right or right is might, you know, we, we tend to defend our positions. That really never works. And so in stillness, I find that it allows for more conversation from other people. And I don't have to always express my opinion. It's better to listen. And even though I'm talking right now and giving you my opinion, so again, contradictory, but stillness is something that I've been trying. And it's uh, also, it brings more wisdom in the quiet. It brings, at least for me. Thank you, Ellie. Yeah, Robert. For me, but, uh, I need to develop courage instead of making major life decisions, vacillating, yes, no, up, down, on, and on, what if could be, now, I don't know, I need more information before I make decisions. I'm in some kind of quagmire where I just really can't make the step to make, to make a decision. So I'm just caught in a, in, a, in, a, in a place where there's just no movement other than just kind of spinning round and round. And it's some major life decisions, uh, relocating, selling house, that, that's, that sort of thing, that, that thing in particular. What if, what if, what if, what if, what if the neighbors are like, well, what if uh, I don't uh, get the right terms of selling the house? Or what if my wife can't find a job? Uh, you know, I need more information. I don't like the terms of the, the lease or the, the rental agreement. You know, and, uh, more information. There's an analogy. My wife told me an analogy. That she, that her, she's from Colombia and they have all kinds of analogies. And she always said the, the monkey was swinging from tree to tree, never lets go of the other, of the initial tree until he grabbed the other one and then he let go. So I think that means something is that you, uh, you have to have some kind of root psychologically or in, a, in order to, to make the next step. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to explain that. You, you may be able to explain it with much more uh, intricacy. Well, Robert, I think you nailed it. You just, you started off with courage. So, 
Um, um, I, 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 I think, you know, it's your journey. I don't have, it's not like I have a, a comment about it, but I think just naming it, whatever it is that you can see it, name it, it has a lot of power. And when you sit in your meditation, Oh, I was, was I muted that whole time? I, I muted, I was trying to mute everyone because there was a lot of reverberation and I didn't mean to mute you, but I accidentally did. I <laughs> oh, could you read sign language? Could you all understand what I was saying? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <sighs> you know, Robert, I was just sort of saying that you, you kind of came up, you came up with the solution in your first sentence that you need courage. And my only um, offering would be that you were very clear, you, you stated it, you're looking at it, you're seeing it, and that's the first step. And many, that's the acceptance in that Aspire model, you know? And I could tell so many humorous situations where I've sat in the meditation room and I had so much disturbance about who was running for president four years ago I was e doing this even, I was going like this <laughs> in the room and I had to get, make peace with this. And I'm, I just go, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, stop, stop, stop. Just get still, just hold that. <laughs> and then I had this realization <sighs> that this, this, and it's not about one person, it's about the movement. That's what, what it was just about this movement where we were going with it. And I went, this is going to wake up America. And it did more than that. <laughs> um, but at least I found the peace. Uh. It, you know, because if I can't be stable, a stable presence, how can I create a space of stability for others to find that? And um, I mean, people were so fearful they were like, you're going to get kicked out of the retreat center. They're going to come after you. And I'm like, I'm looking at this student, grown, intelligent woman, really upset. And I'm going, wait a minute. You know, we're just jumping the gun here. And I just really brought that energy back into stillness. And if I'm still and cool, then I noticed, because we would have, we meet every week, that the group started to be at peace with what was happening. Because in that clarity, we can bring out our tools, what's necessary, what we need to handle that situation. Just as you were explaining, Robert, it feels you know, overwhelming, doesn't it? Um, but when we come in, like the practice I'm hearing from everyone, mm. when I take that time, then okay, I just in the stillness, then this wisdom starts, your innate wisdom starts to speak to you and it's worked for me um but thank you robert anyone <clears throat> i'm hearing i think it's gita is i'm hearing your voice gita did you want to share something no somebody oh maybe it was ellie i <clears throat> no okay i already talked <laughs> So um, what about some of, um, even those I invite, um, Fabiola or Sil Sylvia, Lita or Binta, uh, but if anyone, I really, it's, it, this is where we learn from each other, our experience. Maybe Julia would like to share something. Could you unmute yourself, Julia? Then we can hear you. You just, yeah. Actually, I sort of like to stay muted, but what usually happens is if I let everybody else talk, they've always said something that I would say. So, and, and that has happened once again. Uh, I just had an experience last night where I didn't do well in my assignments and ran into a behavior mode that was, uh, that I've had since my early or late teens, I should say, you know, where you lose all confidence and faith in yourself uh, because you didn't meet a standard you set out for yourself. And 
uh, I went into the dumps and I got upset about that because I thought, aren't you beyond this by now? Uh, but no, uh, old things sometimes revisit themselves and you have to deal with them. And it was mostly, uh, you know, being too hard on myself, which is what I've done most of my life. And so now I, I've come to, I'm fine now. I even got mad at my cats. So here's one of them. Um, but now I'm okay. It was just realizing I have to be kinder to myself, basically. And carry on. No, thank you, Julia. The, these, er, everyone's offering is just balm, really. Balm for the soul. Thank you. Bill? Hi. Uh, yeah, my, my idea was to uh, develop focus better. Um, I, I seem to not uh, finish what I start or what I envision I want to do. Uh, everything from meditation to uh, personal projects to many things. So I, I seem to lack focus. And uh, I think that would uh, allow me to uh, accomplish many more things that I, I plan to, to do in, in this coming year. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, William. Yeah, Fabiola. Hi. Hey. Um, She's speaking from Texas. <laughs> we were because we made a comment earlier. We thought everybody was from the Bay Area. Oh no, we're a little <laughs> far, but hopefully everything clears and we can can meet there in San Francisco someday soon. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so I can be able to hug Gita. I don't know. I just want to hug her. <laughs> 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 um, but um, uh, one of the, the things that I would like to bring out and, and build on is believing in myself that I or this soul <laughs> that is in this body has those powers of being at peace being blissful, that I have all that. It's just believing that I do, that I, uh, that I can't harvest all that peace and love. And that's, that's where I, I struggle a little bit or just believing that I'm, that I'm capable of. Wow. Thank you, Fabiola. Um, I was just wondering if Tony would like to share and then I would share because we when we were in the chat room, both of us, we shared almost similar things. So if she wants to share, let her share. And then I will share too. <laughs> so Tony, yeah. because she couldn't talk much that time, the time was. Yeah. Unmute. There you go. Sorry about that. It's funny because, you know, this does happen to me. Every single person, it's all the things that I can think of are all, I want all of those things. And I have experienced every single thing. That aside, in my conversation, what came up for me, and she was talking about it, is the judgment really working on judgment because during this whole, whatever you want to call it, that's been going on this year, it is so easy to slip into that, whether it's judgment of how other people are behaving around your concerns about the virus, whether it's about politics, whether it's about the future of the world, the wildfires, this, that, and the other. It's about, it, it's so easy to move into that place of trying to find the wrong and correct it. And so for me, that's just a natural thing to work on anyway, because judgment is something I really, really go deep into because of course it starts with myself. So I guess I would take that one thing. I appreciate 
you're talking about it. So it's your turn now. Okay. Uh, well, we had very similar thinking when we shared and we were thinking almost similarly on those issues with the COVID-19 and uh, the emotional things happening or how the people are very insensitive and blah, blah, blah. And then we came up with that. For me, I had a little bit help uh, with my husband when we discussed that he always is a very calm person and whatever he was telling me from that, I was, well, my version of all that was, uh, well, people are only humans. We cannot expect them to be perfect all the time. Even if we believe that everybody has those powers naturally, but our mind, which is a empty, vast space, usually has many useless things in it. And uh, so my new, what do you say, for new year, uh, within 25 days, what I want to develop is not just accept people's behavior if I think that is not right or that is kind of not kind or whatever it is, but I will accept, I'm not going to accept that, yeah, we are like that, but I would say that accept that as a weakness with the situation, it will change. Everything has to change. That this also will pass, people will learn and change for better. And for me, I need to just uh, speak up my mind because I most of the time I just keep quiet or say something very abruptly. So I will speak my mind or uh, I would stand up for myself, my views, but at the same time, I'm not expecting from anybody anything. Does that make sense? I don't know. Oh, yes, Gita, fine. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So uh, I'd like to hand it over to Will. Um, um, I must say, I really appreciate everything that everyone has shared. And this has been a wonderful experience for me. Um, so um, I asked Will if he could kind of wrap things up for us, put a bow on it. <laughs> uh, you, I think your sound is, to it just sounds like you're talking from a very far distance. There's a problem with my computer. I'll try talking louder. Does that help? Yes. Okay, yes. I'll talk louder. <laughs> when all else fails, yell. Can you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You have a Mac, so I wouldn't know what to suggest. But it does. Mine would be a start. It's a little. It's on the old side. I have one suggestion. When you yeah. go down to your microphone, there's an up arrow. Yes. And just make sure it's on the microphone of your preference. Yes, it is. It is. Hmm. I'll just talk a little louder. Can people hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you might just want to mute everybody again. That's okay. a good I'll mute everyone else. Let me do it because that way you, uh, that way I, <laughs> what happens, I'll get, it mutes more than you know. <laughs> Although, yeah, hold on. And then I, you have, oops. There we go. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I just want to begin oh, by yeah, echoing what Sister Elizabeth said. I, there's a lot of wisdom here. People have uh, listed a number of things, which of course are, are very helpful. In, in the afternoon, I mean, in the second section, I heard the importance of compassion, uh, something along the lines of reframing, patience, reconnecting with people from the past, limiting our tendencies to judge ourselves, fostering courage, learning to let go, uh, some gratitude, 
the importance of you know, taking, taking some time to actually sit and practice, uh, settling into stillness, forgiving the self and others, learning to focus, you know, just having a belief uh, in ourselves and faith that there is in fact love and goodness and stability inside of each of us. So I'm hearing all of that and it all rings true for me. It all sounds like a kind of uh, aspiration that I would like to, you know, in total say, yes, I, I would like to build out all of those. I think I'd emphasize more than anything in this day and age, you know, the quality of compassion, recognition of the human condition, the difficulty of having this kind of biology and this kind of consciousness in a world that is doing everything that it's currently doing. That's just inherently hard uh, to face so many different kinds of stresses, uh, both personal and global. And I think we really ought to cut ourselves and one another quite a lot of slack. Like it's, you know, it's kind of, this is a tough situation for us to be in. So if I can't develop as quickly as I wish or accomplish what I wish, et cetera, I want to allow myself some space for that. And if other people, you know, let me down or seem to be confused, I want to allow them space for that, et cetera. I think for myself, my aspiration for the rest of this year and, and for every subsequent year is to bring in a quality of lightness. I mean, everything that we encounter as human beings these days seems to me to generally feel heavy. You can't look at any screen for more than a few minutes without developing a sense of like, oh, there's a lot of heavy stuff going on. And look into the future, especially as we get older, there's a sense of heaviness, like, oh, wow, this is gonna be tough. And even looking at little children, normally that's supposed to be a source of delight, but I find it hard to look at the joy of children and not wonder what's the world gonna be like in 80 years for them. So there's all that heaviness. And I think it's important for me and maybe for lots of people to counteract that with a sense of like, but there is an inherent lightness here too. You know, there's something ultimately playful about life and reality. It's, it's a kind of, it has a kind of effervescence. It can be hard to see it and to feel it, but it's definitely there. And I, building that out as much as we can, you know, doing whatever it takes, you know, watching funny movies, you know, looking at puppies, you know, whatever it is that reminds us, uh, I think is really, really important so that we will have that courage and that fortitude and that focus to, to take the steps that need to be taken to protect the world and preserve it uh, for the future and to keep our souls and our hearts and our minds uh, as whole and healthy as they can be. So I think that's a good closing for as far as it's the best I can do.